Honorable Senators, I see a quorum. We are uh, the Standing Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Trade. Uh, we are meeting today to examine such issues as may arise from time to time relating to foreign relations and international trade generally. As part of this mandate, we will have three uh, guests uh, to give us some information about uh, Tibet at, and the human rights situation in Tibet now. But before we do that, I would ask the senators to introduce themselves. I'll start on my left. Peter Beam, Ontario. Good morning. Raymond Saint-Germain, Quebec. Jean Cordy from Nova Scotia. Patricia Bovey from Manitoba. Tony Dean from Ontario. Mary Coyle from Nova Scotia. Tanango, Ontario. Dennis Patterson, Nunavut. Paul Mascot, Quebec. Steve Green, Nova Scotia. And I'm Marie Neil Andrichuk from Saskatchewan. So welcome to the committee. Uh, we have before us Dr. Sange, uh, who we will uh, hear his remarks. Uh, we uh, have everyone's biography before so that we uh, do not take the uh, precious time that we have here uh, away from really hearing from you and then having uh, a dialogue with you. So, Dr. Sange, you've been here before in the Senate, so um, I'm just going to welcome you on behalf of the committee, and uh, the floor is yours to make your opening remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson, Senator Andrew, and the uh, members of the Foreign Affairs and International Trade. It's a great honor and privilege uh, to be here. Uh, first, let me uh, take 30 seconds to say a few words in Tibetan. Uh, I just express solidarity with uh, uh, Tibetans in Tibet that there is a, a formal hearing uh, on Tibet because this year marks the uh, 60th anniversary of uh, National Uprising Day in Tibet because um, in March 1959, thousands of Tibetans rose up in Tibet to claim that Tibet belongs to Tibetans um, and uh, Tibet should not be occupied. But after that, uh, even uh, as per the uh, Chinese government's official documents, uh, it was established that between the month of March and September of 1959, 87,000 Tibetans were killed. Now, there's another estimation from different sources that approximately 1 million Tibetans have perished under different circumstances since the occupation of Tibet. And this year also marks the um, 30th anniversary of uh, Tiananmen Square tragedy, and many brave Chinese uh, advocated for and died and rather killed for uh, democracy uh, in China. And June 4th, uh, just two days ago, marks the 30th anniversary. And we all know uh, up to or more than a million uh, Muslim Uyghurs uh, are in detention in Xinjiang area as well. So I just want to express my solidarity uh, to them uh, as well. I would like to acknowledge uh, Senator Ta Hai No for uh, proposing a resolution on Tibet uh, where the, the uh, res investigation of human rights in Tibet is uh, considered very important. And for the first time, a middle way approach uh, and a proposal for dialogue uh, with the Chinese government is proposed. So, um, this is a formal resolution. Middle way approach is our policy, which is to say that uh, historically Tibet was an independent country. There is no dispute about it. Even Chinese historians acknowledge that, accept that. But uh, what we say is middle way is a viable option. So we are trying to find a middle ground 
where the Chinese government says sovereignty of China cannot be compromised, territorial integrity cannot be compromised, one China policy cannot be compromised. To that, His Holiness Dalai Lama responded by saying, okay, we could accept all this, provided repression of Tibetans in Tibet end and genuine autonomy is granted to Tibetans in Tibet. So that's the middle ground. So we will not seek separation from China. We will seek autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution. That is the uh, proposal. This is a win-win proposal for the Chinese government, for China and the Tibetan people. So to have a resolution mentioning middle way approach, uh, I think is laudable. Uh, I want to acknowledge that. And also uh, what we uh, uh, seek is you know, preservation of our identity, our religion, our culture, our language is very important. And while we do that, what we want to see uh, is pursuit of our dignity, that's human rights, democracy, and other things. And Canada has been a leader in advocating for uh, democracy and human rights. And uh, so it is very important that Canada shows its leadership on human rights in Tibet as well. So what we would like to see uh, through this hearing uh, from the Canadian government is a consistent and principle stand on human rights and democracy. So with that, I would like to once again uh, thank all the senators who are here and for uh, holding this formal uh, hearing on Tibet. Thank you, because I was told I will have only five or six minutes, so I think I finished my five or six minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank and you. Raptors won yesterday, so I watched the game too. <laughs> All right. I don't know how to respond to that last part. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> but uh, thank you for uh, the uh, time frame that you worked within, and you made your main points. And I do have a long list already, so I'm going to start with Senator Massacott, followed by Senator No. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for being with us this morning. It's much appreciated. Uh, could you? I'm sure when you describe how you saw your relationship with China, uh, you you must have very specifically thought about what kind of structure is that a federation you're seeking? Uh, like, how do you obtain autonomy I mean, and at the same time respect the one China policy? Is it a bit like Taiwan, or could you describe a bit more how you see that? Uh, there are many examples of autonomy, you know, including in Canada, or Quebec, or you know, the First Nations of Nunavut, or uh, you know, South Tyrol in Italy, or Hong Kong, or Taiwan. But I think you know we can always look at similarities, but there are also vast differences. So I think it's always challenging to have you know uh, compare with something. But what we seek is actually uh, less than Hong Kong if you go by specifics. If you look at the document called Memorandum of Genuine Autonomy, uh, it has listed 11 points, the things that we want, which are more or less consistent with the provisions of the Chinese constitution. So hence what we say is genuine autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution. Uh, so that's what we seek. Uh, now we can look at Aceh in Indonesia or Northern Ireland or Scotland or there are many examples around the world. But then um, there are similarities but also differences. So what we seek is within the framework of the Chinese constitution. Now, this came about, as I explained, Chinese government insists that sovereignty and territorial integrity of China cannot be compromised. One China cannot be compromised. So hence his solemnness dilemma envisioned middle way approach, and which was unanimously passed by the Tibetan parliament to say genuine autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution. And what, what, is, the, what is the Chinese government? How, how they, have they responded to your, your principles? Um, yes, that's um, a bit tricky, because what they say is, well, uh, you know, there is hidden agenda for independence. So ultimately, uh, you know, what they uh, suspect uh, is that we want something beyond what we are seeking. So that's what they, I think the, uh, the deficit of trust is the problem. You know, so no matter what we say, even if we say within the framework of the Chinese constitution, so you have a constitution passed in 1984, 
And these are the provisions listed. And Minority National Act of China says this. And our 11 provisions, there are five chapters, all are more or less consistent with the Chinese constitution. And that's what we propose. They say, oh, yo, there, there, there is hidden agenda behind it. So it's the trust deficit. So sometimes when I talk to Chinese officials and scholars, uh, often I say, even if His Holiness goes to you know, high mountains and live in cave, and you know, he goes for retreat for three years, you'll still suspect that he's doing something. Or if he goes deep down in ocean and uh, you know, uh, keeps away from the world for, he says, in a three years and three months, there's a retreat, a very, uh, very famous retreat in uh, Buddhism, you'll still suspect that he's doing something. It's the trust deficit, you know. So again, the, your point is right. You are willing to give, uh, you know, or acknowledge one China to interpretation when it comes to Hong Kong. You have already granted uh, autonomy uh, to Hong Kong on the basis of basic law, one country, two system, and Macau. Now, when we Tibetans say, why can't we get autonomy, similar to but less than Hong Kong or Taiwan, you say you have hidden agenda. So it's the trust deficit. That's what the Chinese government said. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Senator No. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to follow up. You uh, you say the um, the middle way approach is so important in achieving this. Could you elaborate more what concrete steps required to renew the Sino-Tibetan dialogue in order to achieve this? Now, what we propose is a dialogue between envoys of the Dalai Lama and representatives of the Chinese government. And this has taken place before. From 2002 to 2010, envoys of the Dalai Lama met with Chinese counterpart for nine times, formally, um, and then they have had discussion, but there was no breakthrough. So what we propose is that envoys with Dalai Lama meet with, or rather the Chinese representative meet with envoys with the Dalai Lama through this dialogue to discuss on middle way approach and try to find a solution on the issue of Tibet. Can I? Right now you have the problem because Chinese does not recognize Dalai Lama uh, appointment of uh, Jendung Choki Niyama as the official representative for Pension Lama. What do you think about that? So what difficulty do you have in order to have the dialogue with the Chinese? Now, uh, the, there is difficulty, but also, as I said, you know, Canada should have consistent and principled stand on human rights. Chinese government also should have consistent and principled stand on dialogue. With the U.S. trade war, that's what they, what they say is through dialogue, we must solve this issue. Let's have dialogue. So when we Tibetans say, let's have dialogue to solve the issue on human rights, they don't want to have dialogue so far. You know? So they don't, they don't uh, show this consistency when it comes to dialogue. You're right. Genin Chuk Nyima, Pension Lama, uh, was recognized or rather endorsed by His Holiness Dalai Lama as the genuine reincarnation of the 10th Pension Lama. But at the age of five, he disappeared. Now he's 30 years old. We don't know where he lives. So it's been 25 years since he has disappeared. So you're right. The Chinese government has not been consistent. This is a spiritual matter. And His Holiness has right to endorse the pension lama. But then Chinese government has made him disappear. And some say even abducted. Thank you. Senator Kaur. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for being with us, President Sange. Um, I, I'm very sympathetic, and I think we, we all are as Canadians sympathetic to what you're uh, expressing to us today. I'm curious about uh, two things. Um, first of all, um, you're talking about uh, autonomy for Tibetans within Tibet, within the framework of the Chinese uh, constitution the importance of uh, the Tibetan culture, religion, language. Um, and you talk also about dignity, human rights, and uh, democracy. Could you dis first describe uh, for us uh, how Tibet, uh, in that new, uh, old but new <laughs> situation of autonomy, um, would function as a democracy? 
and then I have one follow-up. Uh, technically, once you seek genuine autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution, the democracy as we know it is limited, constrained, because you have to function within the framework of the Chinese constitution. Having said that, given a choice, we would like to have full-fledged democracy because Tibetan administration, uh, that I am the political head, uh, functions on the basis of democracy. You know, we had our parliament elected since 1960, and my position also is elected by directly elected by Tibetans all over the world in 40 countries, including Tibetans in Canada. So. Uh, ours is a robust, transparent, very vibrant uh, democracy. So given a choice, that's what we want to prefer, and that's what we already practice. You know, In fact, I would go a little further and say our parliamentary system um, is, you know, parliament session is more robust than uh, many of the countries in the world. I will not name Canada, because um, just a few months ago, we had this parliamentary session, and I had to face 250 questions for two and a half days. And I have to give uh, answers, you know, uh, right then and there. So I doubt there will be any parliament where the president of the administration will face parliament and answer questions for two and a half days. I mean, they finished questions. If they had more questions, I will be answering to them for three or four or five days, no matter how, how long does it take. So our democracy system is quite robust. And we have a judiciary too, which tries civil cases. And our auditor general is very powerful. You know, and we have election commission too. So I think with three branches of democracy and other independent commission, it's a functioning, vibrant democracy. How would you reconcile that functioning, vibrant democracy that you have described with the uh, obvious ambition to re-embed and, and also uh, create an autonomous situation for those Tibetans in Tibet, but also the Tibetans outside of Tibet. How would you reconcile that in that framework that we're discussing? Yes, that's why I said, given a choice, we want we prefer the exiled Tibetan democracy system. But our priority is, and rightfully so, should be 6 million Tibetans in Tibet. And for 6 million Tibetans in Tibet, our priority is to elevate their sufferings and human rights violation and give them a situation or circumstances better than what they have now. So our preference is, you know, genuine autonomy where they can have their own administration, they can practice their own language, their own culture, their own religion, so that's where they can preserve their identity. And that's under threat. And that's the number one priority. So, you know, exiled Tibetans are 150,000, so we are just, you know, uh, five percent of the population, or two two point five percent. So for our priority is, you know, uh, ninety plus percent of Tibetans in Tibet. That's, that's why we are functioning on genuine autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sanjivan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Merci, merci beaucoup d'être ici. Thank you very much for being here. You have helped us. You have helped us to better understand. The situation on that point, my question will have to do with uh, the issue of countering misinformation and false information that is uh, distributed about Tibet in a number of countries, including Canada. Over the past few months, some groups. So I'll try to. Uh, I'm a francophone, but I'll try to uh, draft my question in English. Okay. So uh, I, I, my, my question is with regard to the disinformation uh, about uh, Tibet. This disinformation uh, for the last, at least for the last few months, came from a few groups pro-Beijing uh, who made uh, the headlines for, uh, trying to, for having tried to intimidate uh, Chinese uh, citizens, especially Tibetans, in the Canadian territory. Uh, last April, the pro pekin group Tibetan Association of Canada was uh, suspected for having circulated false letters from pretending that these letters were coming from the prime minister as well as the immigration minister. 
And this organization is no notably suspected of following uh, instructions directly from the Chinese authorities. So do you believe that first we can uh, fear uh, an increase of this type of actions, of disinformation in, the, in Canada? And do you have any suggestions for us in order to uh, counter these uh, disinformation attempts? Uh, thank you very much. That's a very important uh, question. The, uh, uh, the registration of Tibetan Association of Canada uh, and uh, with the fake endorsement uh, from the PMO's office uh, is a serious matter, uh, mainly because we have Tibetans in Ontario and Ottawa and um, the Tibetans all over Canada, and they are the genuine representative of the Tibetan people. This Tibetan Association, so-called Tibetan Association of Canada, does not represent 99% of Tibetans in Canada. So it's mis misleading, and what they did is fraudulent. So I think we should be very vigilant about it because they have attempted to do so in U.S., and they have tried so in Australia too. And these people uh, represents a fringe fundamentalist uh, kind of a group, uh, which are, we believe, used by the Chinese government uh, for, uh, for their own political purpose. Uh, hence, we should be very careful and vigilant. And for the fraud that they have committed and whatever legal recourse needs to be taken, should be taken. Because I think this is just the beginning. Uh, registration is one thing, and then activities will follow. And we should be very, very careful about that. Sub-question, Madam Chair? Uh, would you be aware of other uh, such associations uh, uh, which are active in Canada? Um, I think this is the, f informally I'm sure there are some, this is the first attempt to have a formal registration. And they uh, did so also in the U.S. And they don't represent 99% of Tibetans. That we can be absolutely certain. Because we have you know, few Tibetans in Ottawa, and Tibetan Association members are here. They... Uh, get together, they elect their executives, even in Toronto, in, uh, uh, in Calgary, in Vancouver. So we elect uh, you know, the representatives through democratic process. And they just come and register and claim to represent Tibetans in Canada, which they absolutely do not represent. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Bovey, I have now a long list again. Senator Bovey, Senator Atulajan, Senator Patterson, Senator Bean. And we're fast running out of time, but so I'm sure we can fit you all in. Uh, <clears throat> I want to uh, thank you, sir, for being being with us today. And uh, <clears throat> as one who has followed um, this uh, recent history very closely, having uh, invited and received the Dalai Lama uh, in British Columbia, gosh, about 20 years ago or more, um, I uh, know that you're seeking, as you say, that middle ground uh, uh, regarding uh, culture and language. I wonder if you can talk more, please, about religion and uh, uh, where that is uh, in your, your, your discussions now or your concerns now. Um, and as I said, I have had the privilege to work with uh, many of the Dalai Lama's monks, both from India and those in Canada, over, over many years. Uh, we are very proud that the Solonist Dalai Lama was received by uh, Canada on various occasions, and he still is the honorary citizen of Canada. So we are very proud uh, of that. And uh, thank you very much for uh, receiving him and in helping uh, Tibetan monks. Uh, as far as religion is concerned, it's vital. Uh, Tibetan civilization is based on Buddhist principles and Buddhist values. Uh, hence, the Communist Party of China knew that when they invaded Tibet, the first thing they did was destroy 98% of Tibetan monasteries and nunneries. 99.9% .9 of monks and nuns were disrobed. Religion as we knew it just physically disappeared from the world. But the good news is, after 60 years, Buddhism is back in Tibet in social and private space. What is happening in Tibet is Tibetans are doing on their own. As far as Chinese government is concerned, they want to systematically destroy, dilute Tibetan Buddhism, 
make Tibet into a Chinatown, Tibetan into Chinese. So there is, you know, lot, lots of restrictions on religious practices uh, in Tibet. But uh, Buddhism is back. The assertion of Tibetan identity is back in social and private space. What it shows is that on the spiritual front, after 60 years, we have prevailed, or rather we are prevailing from 98% of destruction with only 2% chances of success. We took that as a Buddhist with you know, resilience on our side and rugged spirit of mountain people. Uh, we fought and we have preserved uh, Tibetan Buddhism, so we are very proud. But the policy remains, and consistently you hear and you read about Serta in the Larungar Monastery in Serta being destroyed from 20,000 monks and nuns is being demolished, reduced to half, and Yashingar with 5,000 nuns is being demolished as we speak. So all these are taking place despite all the challenges. Uh, preservation of Buddhism is very important for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Atulajan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. My my question, too, was uh, about uh, religion um, and with Senator Bovia. So I, I would um, just like to take it a bit further and say that um, when we look at uh, Tibet, when we look at the Uyghurs who are in internment camps, um, there were stories coming out of, you know, the last month was Ramadan, where they were forced to eat. Uh, they couldn't fast. Um, so religion seems to play a big part in, you know, where... China refuses to have a dialogue or keeping the Uyghurs in camps and saying they're reprogramming them. Um, but you have prevailed. Tibetans have prevailed. Um, you know, from some, someone who is from that part of the world, from the subcontinent, we grew up listening to the stories. We heard about the monasteries, the wealth of information, the libraries that you have. So tell me, what is life like for an ordinary Tibetan right now? All that information... Have, has anything been saved? Um, it's a very closed-off area, very difficult to get to. Um, yet, you continue to flourish. You continue to have a voice. And also, are you use is are the younger people using social media to get their message out? Um, social media is very much uh, restricted in Tibet as well. You know, you have they use the what we call Chinese firewall to prevent any information from going inside Tibet. What they have is a policy called one and uh, 100, meaning uh, they will you know, export 100% of the information or propaganda to the outside world, but they will not let even 1% of information from outside world come inside Tibet. So that's their uh, policy. So it's very, very uh, uh, difficult. And you're right, um, as you are from a very prominent family in Pakistan. So, you know, um, Uyghurs are under very difficult situation. They are not allowed to celebrate Ramadan. They are not allowed to name uh, you know, their children uh, after, you know, uh, uh, holy uh, saints uh, of uh, uh, Muslim faith. Um, and even in Tibetan monasteries, if the monastery runs a school, to teach Tibetan language. The monasteries are given notice to shut down those schools and throw away all those Tibetan children below the age of 18 and send them to Communist Party schools. So even the private efforts uh, are being restricted. So on the one hand, I did say that, you know, from 2% chances we have succeeded, but it's in context, I'm saying. What they destroyed is physically they destroyed everything. And the... In Tibetan monasteries, we have you know statues made out of gold and silver and different kinds of stones. Seventy-five percent were burned, melted, and have disappeared. What we recovered is only twenty-five percent. So again, I just want to put that in context. When you say we have succeeded, it's it's I'm not saying we have succeeded, hundred percent. So a lot of challenges even now, uh, it's going on. Uh, so. For example, the best example is the Chokhang Temple. It's the holy shrine in the Tibetan Buddhist world. It's like Mecca or Vatican for us. If you go to Chokhang Temple in Lhasa today, there are sharpshooters on the rooftop. So there are cameras watching over you. So some Tibetans have said, so there are more you know, uh, 
cameras uh, following you than the butter lamp that we offer in the temple. You know, so there are more guns pointing at you than the monks who are inside the temple. I and mean, that's a way of saying, you know. Um, so in fact, also, uh, for example, those who monk, those Tibetans and monks who want to come to India to seek teachings from His Holiness Dalai Lama, their passports are not only denied, now they are taken back, uh, even those who got passports. So there was one Tibetan blogger who said, Tibetans have better chances of going to heaven than going to India to seek teachings from His Holiness Dalai Lama, because not even 1% of Tibetans are given passport. Uh, so, so these are the restrictions imposed on uh, to, to have religious practices of Tibetans. Thank you. I'm going to turn to our final member of the committee, Dr. Senator Beam, and then followed by Senator Patterson to conclude. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Sange, for being with us today. Um, your uh, comments are, of course, very compelling. Uh, I'm wondering if over the past few years your international advocacy has suffered um, in any way. And I say that because uh, we have seen at the same time a, a greater assertiveness by China on, uh, on the international stage, uh, whether it has been, as has become traditional repercussions for the diplomatic reception of the Dalai Lama in various countries, or indeed on, on other matters uh, where sometimes uh, uh, trade actions are seen as a, as a reprisal for uh, engaging too much in in the Tibetan question, if I can put it that way. So I, I I'm I'm curious as to whether you are finding um, that the doors are still open when you travel. Obviously, the doors are open here in Canada, uh, but uh, but in Europe and indeed at the uh, at the Human Rights Council uh, in Geneva. I just want to uh, thank uh, Senator for asking the question. Yeah, it's uh, not that common to have a formal hearing on Tibet like we are ha having it. So it's very courageous and honorable on the part of the committee and especially the members who are present here. Just to show up for the hearing means a lot, <laughs> means, means a lot because you're sending a clear message to Beijing and especially to Tibetans who are suffering in Tibet that you care for human rights, you care uh, for their you know, uh, uh, environmental uh, issues as well. Now, Although Freedom House has come out with a report for the last three years, in all three years they have listed Tibet as the least free region after Syria. Now we all know about Syria, but the second least free region in the whole world is Tibet. And uh, we want to uh, share that uh, to the rest of the world, but the Chinese government presence is everywhere and they're very, very strong. I was in uh, Lithuania uh, for uh, 36 hours, and the Chinese embassy issued a press release condemning my visit. I was in South Africa uh, last year, and they issued a press release, and they said 100 people to protest uh, against my visit to a talk that I was giving at the law school. They stormed the auditorium, they stormed the stage, and uh, chased away all the students. And last November, I was speaking at University of Toronto. I think 50 or 60 Chinese students just showed up with the Chinese national flag singing Chinese national anthem. In fact, I called some of them inside so that we could have dialogue after the talk. So there, I think the, the tentacles of the Chinese government is everywhere. And what is most disturbing is the elite co-optation. When you see ministers after ministers, I don't want to say bought, but rather change uh, their service from being a minister of a country to a consultant of the Chinese company or government, that's very disappointing. I have had the privilege of going to Australia. One time the talk was whether the foreign minister of Australia would meet with me or not. Next time when I reached, he was the consultant for the Chinese government. The trade minister of Australia was paid, I think, 800000 dollars a year, and he's a consultant from a Chinese uh, company. And even a foreign minister of a European country I would not name um, has become a president of a major international... Okay, I'll name the uh, uh, Davos World Economic Forum, you know, supported by the Chinese government, is a former foreign minister of Norway. Um, and when you see that, it's very disturbing. What the Chinese government is trying to do is restructure United Nations, redefine human rights, 
uh, so that the political rights and civil rights as we know it, which is inalienable, which is fundamental, which is universal, is it's, it's made secondary uh, to, you know, uh, what they call, quote-unquote, development. You know, so if as long as government provides bread, butter, and shelter, citizens should keep quiet, you know, and then uh, you will have no democracy, no freedom of speech, and that's what socialism with Chinese characteristic mean. So I think the whole world, the, the world order, it's under threat, under stress, because they're redefining everything. And it's no more simply a Tibet issue. Tibet is the litmus test. If you are for democracy and human rights, you have to be for Tibet. Then if you don't speak out for Tibet, then you are not for human rights and democracy. That's why I applaud the consistency and principle stand of Canadian government and uh, Canadian leaders. That needs to uh, continue. Hence, you are right. From country to country, they are coming under enormous stress from the Chinese government. Having said that, many countries are again pushing back. Uh, for example, Czech Republic has the largest uh, Tibet parliamentary support group in whole of Europe. We have 51 members of parliament signed up. And Japan has the largest group in the whole world. 91 members of the parliament and 60 or 70% from the ruling party are part of the Tibet parliamentary support group. And we also have in Canada, Canada Tibet Parliament to support group and some of the members are here uh, in this order. They're doing a very good job. And one of the unique projects they have is to hire Tibetans as interns. And some of them are sitting at the back here. They come to do summer interns and they learn about Canadian parliamentary or the government process and they share uh, their Tibetan experience and they go back and become leaders in the Tibetan community. This unique uh, project is being now and replicated in other parts of the world. So on that front, I think the Canadian Parliament Support Group and we have Honourable Member James who is here, they have done a very good job. So I hope you all will join them as well and make it bigger, perhaps the biggest in the world. So that needs to cross 92 members of Parliament. I Thank hope you. it happens. Jointly with Senators and the members of Parliament, it will happen. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to turn to our final uh, senator to ask the final question, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and we're honored to have you, you here, uh, Mr. President. I guess in, in wrapping this up, you talked about um, Canada's uh, stand on human rights uh, in, uh, in improving ways. Uh, it's the job of Senate committees to make recommendations to the Government of Canada. What would you... May I ask you, what would you like to see the committee recommend that the federal government, the government of Canada should do respecting the human, that it's not doing now perhaps, respecting the human rights situation in Tibet? I think the uh, Honourable Senator knows the resolution which is proposed uh, in the Senate. I think it's a good start. It has all the uh, provisions that are you know, important uh, for a uh, Tibet issue. And specifically, I already mentioned about human rights and the middle way approach and dialogue, which are very, very important. One provision, mm. it says, it, which is number D, grant Canada reciprocal diplomatic access to Tibet without limitations. This is very important because I think it's been since 2013, the Canadian ambassador or consulate general have not visited Tibet, which means the access to Tibet is denied deliberately by the Chinese government. And recently, just a month ago, a few weeks ago, the U.S. ambassador to uh, China uh, was allowed to visit Tibet, mainly because last year the U.S. Congress passed a bill called Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act uh, and signed by President Trump. Now, it's a law which requires that any number of... Uh, uh, Chinese officials, uh, scholars, and uh, journalists, and researchers, students, and tourists can come to America. But similar access should be given to uh, Americans who want to uh, visit Tibet. If not, the State Department uh, will determine which officials and which uh, people should be denied entry uh, to America. So the State Department is in the process of collecting data as to whether the Chinese uh, uh, the embassies um, and uh, council generals are issuing visas, granting visas to American citizens who want to visit Tibet or not. 
If not, then the State Department take action. I think similar action should be recommended by uh, the Senate uh, that reciprocal access, I think it's just fair. It's, you know, any number of Chinese can come. Similar number of Ma the Canadians should be allowed to go to Tibet. If not, we will at least take action to those officials who are deliberately denying visas or um, uh, punishing or repressing Tibetans in Tibet. I think, Senator Patterson, you have been a leader on this front, you know, uh, from your background and from your experience. I think this will send the right message uh, that the Chinese government cannot act with impunity when it comes to human rights. So we must have a principal stand and say, you know, just give us equal access. And that's uh, very uh, fair. I think that needs to be uh, done, I think so. Thank you. Dr. Sanjay, we run out of time, as we often do in this committee. We uh, tackle very complex problems in a very short time, so we do the best we can. Uh, we want to thank you for your very uh, articulate, frank, and measured, um, quiet approach to a very, very important issue that should be on the minds of Canadians and the, the world community. We should know the facts and we should make our uh, own judgments uh, based on that. You've added to our dialogue, you've added to our reflections, and to our need to really think more deeply on this topic. So thank you, Dr. Sanjay, on behalf of the committee. Thank you, uh, Chairperson uh, Senator Andrew Chok and uh, the committee members for this privilege and honor. Given your law background, I'm also from law background, so I think uh, justice, uh, is very much uh, is needed uh, in Tibet, and I hope we all will work and uh, uh, make it happen sooner than later. Thank you very Thank much. You. Senator 